Thank you again uh, to, all, to everybody for joining us and welcome to the webinar of the European Space Agency and COSI Lab. Um, today we're going to talk about the future of the European ground control. And let me start by saying that in the context of space missions, the importance of the ground segment is sometimes overlooked, but it is also a fact that space missions are prepared and then operated from the ground. So from this perspective, the ground segment plays a crucial role. And in this context, we will today be talking about the current status of the European ground segment software framework. We will discuss its impact on the ground segment systems and mission control systems. And we will also talk about what the future has in store. Um, for the participants who haven't met COSILAP yet, I'm going to describe the company in just a few sentences, not to waste too much time. So we are an international group of over 250 experts with branches in the EU, Switzerland, USA, China, and Japan. And we provide control systems for the world's, I would say, most complex and unique and precise machines. And by this, I mean all everything from particle accelerators, telescope arrays, nuclear fusion, proton therapy system, systems, as well for the as well as for the semiconductor industry and, of course, for space. Um, I will spare the time and I won't talk about our specific projects, but let me just mention a very interesting one. And um, almost 20 years ago, COSI Lab designed the control system for the ALMA telescope array. And this telescope array um, in 2019 was part of the Event Horizon telescope and it successfully obtained the humankind's first image of a supermassive black hole that you can see on your screens. So today's discussion will include also the part where COSI Lab contributes to the future space missions. And before we go on, um, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, today we have with us uh, Mr. Jean Schutz and Jakob Lipschitz joining us from ISA, and Diego Casadei and Micha Vitorovic from COSI Lab. Jean Schutz is an uh, operating operations data systems manager at ESOC in the ground uh, data systems infrastructure section. He's responsible for the development and maintenance of generic ground segment applications. Jakob Lifschitz, um, he has been involved in the development of European ground support equipment, monitoring and control systems since 2005. And Jakob started working for UMETSAT and later on in ESA. And since 2012, he has been working at ESA as a software and later also as a system engineer. From COSI Lab, we have Diego Casade joining us. Diego contributed to the development of three successfully operated missions and one proposed mission, starting with R&D and software development with the cosmic ray detectors, AMS-1 and 2. And he became a technical coordinator of the X-ray spectroscopy imager instrument called STIX of the ESA Solar Orbiter mission. He was also the project lead of the proposed Miss Alpha X-ray microsatellite. Um, and also from COSI Lab, we have Miha Vitorovic. Miha has 25 years of experience in software development, architecture, and project and team management. And recently, Miha has been leading all COSI Lab ESA and space-related activities in the development sector. Um, finally, my name is Tadej Pukel. I've been with COSI Lab for the past few years. And my role today will be to moderate what I believe will be an interesting discussion. So welcome again to all the panelists and to the audience. And let's start the debate. And let's kick off with a brief overview of what the ground segment actually is. I'm first turning to you, uh, Diego, as you're the industry insider. Could you briefly explain the functions of the ground segment and the role of software in it? Thanks, today. Yes. Um, so. Let me recall my experience in, in uh, you know, the assembly, integration, and testing of, uh, uh, for example, the STIX instrument of solar orbit. Uh, you know, what, what you have is uh, uh, more and more work that uh, piles up. You know, uh, the pressure increases. Uh, everybody has to you know, do the, the testing in time. And of course, the, the ground software, which is on the electrical ground uh, um, support equipment, has to support all of these uh, integration and testing phase. However, you know, there is more and more pressure on the people, the software, even the instrument software always comes at the end. So it's a rush, right? So, and you know, there is a lot of work happening at the very end, in particular, so piling up a lot of pressure and, and the role of these uh, software, right? Which allows you to interact with an instrument, make debugging, testing, performance, calibration is essential. 
I think this is uh, really um, an aspect that uh, sometimes gets uh, underestimated, you know, and, and people think about it when it is a bit too late. Yeah, yeah. Ah, thank you, Diego. This sounded very familiar. Um, I also think that project leaders often regret for not dealing with software design and impl implementation earlier in the project, and it all comes in the end. And speaking of software, let's talk a little bit about mission control systems because these are an integral part of the ground segment. Uh, perhaps, Jean, uh, could you give us a high-level overview of what the mission control system consists of? Yes, a mission control system um, as a uh, traditional uh, system um, consists of uh, the mission control system backend software that runs on service, um, the client interfaces, the client user interfaces uh, used by the flight control team, and a number of standardized interfaces um, to interface ancillary systems, such as uh, mission planning systems and flight dynamic systems. Um, it fulfills three major functions, um, the reception, the decoding, and the display of telemetry of, of the spacecraft or spacecraft. Uh, it um, supports the creation and verification of commands and the transmission of the commands to the ground stations for uplinking to the spacecraft. And it serves as an archive um, to archive all the telemetry and telecommands um, issued and received via um, the ground stations through the lifetime of the mission. Mm -hmm. Interesting, thank you. Um, and now that we have this basic understanding of you know, how complex or important the ground segment is in a mission. Let me also ask if ground segment uh, technologies are developing at the same pace as the flight segment technologies, for example. Uh, well, that I, I would uh, not set the pace of the uh, ground segment development at the pace of the space segment, because as you know, due to the harsh conditions in the space, we have to use special hardware, which in terms of performance, for example, and functionality lacks uh, quite a lot. It's sometimes something which was uh, used 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. The pace uh, should be set uh, more by consumer level software, like what you have on your uh, mobile phone, what you have on the internet when you use, for example, online banking. And this is at the moment a little bit problematic because this cost 2000 system, which is uh, still used and it's working fine, but uh, the paradigm uh, come from 90s and it's still the user interface from the 90s and all the approach from the 90s. And this is what has to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. And are different ground segment systems used for different mission phases like pre-launch and post-launch? Uh, yes, that's another problem. Uh, even though certain um, subsystems can be reused uh, both in AIT in pre-launch and uh, in mission control systems, uh, still there is a big uh, divergency and uh, data have to be migrated, converted, transferred between different entities and between different phases. There's also something to tackle to optimize the development and the costs. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, Jakob. Um, and Looking only at Europe, are, ground, are different ground segment systems used by different agencies and organizations? Um, yes, indeed. Um, currently, ESA uh, uses um, SCOS 2000 as mission control system, but other agencies and organizations use um, uh, very different uh, products, either their own implementations or there are a certain number of uh, also commercial uh, mission control systems available. Um, and these systems have uh, incompatible data and procedure and display definitions. Um, so for missions that are performed under collaboration between ESA and other organizations, uh, for example, UMITSAT, um, there might be um, some overlaps, for instance, uh, for certain spacecraft. Um, ESA has in the past um, provided a LEOP service um, for another organization. And after successful LEOP, uh, the spacecraft is handed over for routine operations, um, for mm -hmm. instance, to UMITSAT. Um, this means that um, because the um, routine uh, mission control system was based on a different product, um, the preparation phase 
had to um, create a tail ring for both the SCOS 2000 based system and the other mission control system. Um, also, uh, displays, procedures, and telecommands need to be done um, specifically to uh, according to um, the mission con control system use. This means a certain overlap and duplication of work to a certain extent, and also bears, of course, the risk that one is done in an inconsistent way with regards to the other. Um, yeah, but these are um, current challenges that we have, and uh, in the future, <laughs> we hope to um, improve on that. Okay, great, great. And how do you think that the mission control operations will benefit from the modern frameworks, such as the European ground segment, uh, ground systems, common core? Exactly. So the EGSSC initiative um, has as its goal uh, to provide a common platform um, for uh, all European missions if uh, organizations are willing to adopt it. Um, so this can help in, in the particular example that I just gave uh, with HumanSat, when we have a cooperation um, when doing a particular mission to have a unified mission control systems on, in both organizations. So um, we can reduce the level of um, uh, duplication and overlap of work done specifically on one system or the other. Well, thank you for these insights uh, very much, Jean. And if we now go back again to the industry side, Diego and Miha, how do you see that the introduction of a standardized framework affects the cost and the risk that is related to development and utilization of ground segment technologies? Maybe I can answer that today. So uh, yeah. let me reconnect to what I said before about you know, the final asymmetric integration and testing activities. The traditional approach right, is that every, every collaboration builds up uh, the, the supporting software, which includes, of course, everything that uh, we are mentioning right now, right? Now, put it in, in, a, in a context, right, of increasing pressure and, and deadlines that are coming, a lot of work, right? And think what happens if instead we have, you know, a well-designed framework, which is implemented and provides already basic functionality, right? So the pressure on you decreases enormously because you don't need to reinvent the wheel, right? And, and by, by relying on tested framework, also your risk decreases and so also the pressure. Right? So uh, there is, you know, psychologically a big difference in terms of uh, costs is also, you know, simple, so less expensive to develop that. And when you put in the, in, the, in the perspective, because, you know, usually space missions have a long lifetime, right? So mm -hmm. a well-designed system is easier to maintain, to evolve, to upgrade. So I think there are many advantages here. Interesting. Yeah, for, for, for me, I mean, it's obvious that, you know, small companies have a, for us, bar to entry into the space um, domain is, is pretty high. I mean, the mastering the domain itself, we, which is quite uh, huge, is, is very challenging on its own. But, uh, you know, with that, you are either left to, to develop your own framework for testing or if you work as a subcontractor to, to one of the primes, you need to, to learn a, a new framework each time that you start working with, with the new prime. So, um, and both of these things actually, you know, increase the, the risk and uh, the cost for, for companies, you know. So either a project is can be late or it can be over budget or, or both. So definitely having just one framework that you need to learn and master and then reuse for, for all the projects would be a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. So talking about frameworks, um, at CozyLab, we are actively working on such a standardized framework for ESA. It's called EGSCC and we have mentioned it before. Um, it's being developed with the aim of addressing all the challenges that we're talking about today. But still, perhaps, Jakob, can you tell us a little bit more about the EGSCC initiative so that the audience has a better has a better feeling? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so the EGCC initiative, uh, it originated from the industry request to enhance uh, efficiency and to improve exchange um, between different uh, stakeholders and to different phases of missions. Uh, to share costs and to address obsolescence of uh, existing systems. Uh, basically, the aim is to make uh, European space industry more competitive. 
Uh, the development of HGCC, it's more than five years already. It started um, uh, as a joint undertaking between uh, different stakeholders, um, in, uh, space agencies, national space agencies, uh, like uh, CNES, DLR, UK Space Agency, and also big uh, large integrators like Airbus Satellites, Airbus Trans Space Transportation, uh, Thales Alenia France, Thales Alenia Italy, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, it resulted as a, in a collaboration agreement uh, among agencies and primes, uh, which was signed at the highest level uh, by CEOs and DG of um, each organization. And it covers the uh, development of kernel and reference implementation components. Uh, it covers commitment to use EGCC for future projects. Uh, it covers also uh, the commitment to share maintenance um, costs among different stakeholders. And um, the commitment to make EGCC products uh, available uh, to the European industry. So the idea is to get a universal system which can be used um, throughout different phases uh, of the mission, which uh, specifies, um, uh, standardizes the exchange interfaces and which has a modular uh, structure. So if you want to replace certain functionality, you can easily do this, uh, just replacing a particular module uh, and keeping the rest of the system uh, intact. Uh, the technology used, uh, of course, is um, quite a challenge because we want to have the system running for at least 20 years. And this is the main technological challenge to uh, make it running and working over this uh, time frame. Uh, obsolescence management is a big talk there. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Jakob. Thank you, Jakob. And Jean, looking from your experience on missions, could you give us an overview of the challenges in, moder in modernizing mission control systems to be compatible with the EGSCC framework? Yes, um, EGSCC is a, a very new system and it has been developed with uh, new technologies um, specifically to take advantage of the development and the new hardware capabilities that machines have. And we know that uh, machines do not scale linearly as they used to do in the 80s and 90s, um, but they are now evolving more on a parallel basic with multi-processing uh, and, and uh, processing clusters. So EGSCC comes with an architecture uh, that uses a distributed um, uh, storage, for instance, for archiving uh, parameters, telecommands, and packets. Um, so it utilizes a, a cloud-based uh, storage cluster. And that uh, means uh, at the level of um, deployment, a lot of changes because these clusters will be also reused and shared across missions. Traditionally, a mission would own their own servers um, that are used only for the purpose of the mission and not shared with anybody else in other missions. So this is a change in uh, deployment in IT architecture, networks, type of machines being used. And then we have also the changes of the uh, concept itself, um, the, the, the base concepts and the modeling of the mission control system. Um, a previous MCS, as, as COS 2000, relies on a um, data model and on a mission model that is um, a set of tables which have relationship to each other in a relational paradigm. Um, the EGSCC has a hierarchical model using object-oriented concepts. So this is very new also for the teams involved in preparing the mission and in the flight control teams. Um, so this uh, is uh, a challenge uh, for the teams to get uh, to know these new concepts, to learn about um, the, the new data model. So there's a lot of, of uh, challenge in, in training up these uh, people and the teams. Um, the new EGSCC um, system comes also with a new set of user interfaces. Um, one major aspect of EGSCC is that it is not uh, designed from ground up to be specifically a mission control system to control spacecraft. It is actually spacecraft agnostic. It is a control system that can be utilized for any type of complex system. It can be a spacecraft, but it can be a ground station or a network of ground stations, or could be also um, utilized to 
uh, control into industrial processes. So all the models do not contain any notions of space or spacecraft. And that, that means that there is a, uh, there's a, a tailoring to be done um, in order to map the concepts of spacecraft, ground stations to the concepts of EGLCC, which are all generic. Um, so this is another challenge in also customizing the front end, which again, in the spirit of ETSCC is agnostic to space. So it does not have by default uh, spacecraft command stack or something like that, but it has generic um, views and uh, displays that, that can be tailored, but um, this tailoring needs experience, it needs knowledge about the system in order uh, to make it something that is a fit um, for a specific mission. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Jean. I think you made a really clear and concise overview here. And I will now turn again to the industry side, uh, to Diego and Micha. In your opinion, what is the view or what is your view on the benefits and the challenges in this respect? Um, to emphasize the benefits, it's probably good to remember that each company and each institute makes a, a treasure of the lessons learned, right? This builds up the heritage of, a, of a, uh, an entity. And the heritage is so really important that, you know, all space agencies have, you know, collected uh, lessons learned. And, and think, for example, the ECSS uh, set of recommendations, okay? So they give you guidelines to do things in, uh, in a way that has been proven to be good in the past, okay? And still you have to do the work, right? Now, think about uh, a way of, of implementing part of these recommendations into a framework that yet uh, leaves you freedom to adapt it to whatever you have to do in particular, but still gives you the concepts, the, the best practices, and it's, you know, something that you will adapt, not reinvent from scratch. And, you know, th this is uh, really valuable because, you know, starting from a book and doing the work from scratch or starting from uh, uh, working implementation are completely different starting points, right? Um, so, as, as was said before, um, EGSCC is not designed to be uh, a cage, right? There is a lot of customization to be done, and uh, you need experts of the mission and of the instrument to do the customization, but they start from something which is very concrete, and this is great uh, advantage. And, uh, you know, usually, the the ground support equipment including the software is developed together with the instrument and that adds a lot of complexity and uh, and you know you don't get usually a part of the instrument already developed for you right you have to start from scratch and if we can save that uh, with the software that is a great advantage yeah um me i would maybe just uh, more address the challenges that that i see with this so uh, definitely one thing that I see is that, you know, good support needs to be provided. So abundant information, detailed manuals, not just for the tools, but but also very good explanations of the core concepts of, of the data model and the back practice, best practices for working with it. And of course, you know, um, these resources, it's good that they are online, that we have knowledge bases, wikis, uh, tutorials, um, and everything available to, to the users as they need them. And of course, um, training courses need to be provided because it's, it will be quite a huge and, and complex task. And of course, um, in the end, if the problems arise, users will definitely need responsive support channels uh, where you can get response for, for any question within a business day. And um, in the end, regular version updates of, of the entire system, which, which gives you confidence that the system is maintained and developed and that any challenges that you may encounter will be removed uh, very shortly in a new version update. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much both. Um, I believe that by now we have learned about the complexity of EGSC and that there must be a broad field of stakeholders. And my next question would be how the community can participate in the development of EGSCC. Jean, could you tell us? 
Yes. So EGSSC um, will be distributed under a European community license. And that means that any party within uh, the uh, European community can uh, get access to EGSSC for free and utilize it for its own purpose. Um, at high level, um, the EGSSC is separated in two part. One core part that contains the definition of all the interfaces and the data model and the layer of reference implementations uh, that can be further customized by organizations um, to fit their needs. But always keeping the models and the interfaces common such that inter exchangeability of data and collaboration is guaranteed. Um, we plan to um, have a community that will maintain the EGSCC core and also have a community built around um, customizations of EGSCC um, that would allow uh, you know, specific functions that have been implemented to be shared across other organizations in Europe. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Jean. Um, I believe that we've covered many interesting topics so far. We got some great insight. Um, let's try shortly looking also a little bit into the future. What's, what's next for EGSCC? Jakob, what do you think? Uh, well, uh, first of all, EGSCC is still in the consolidation phase. And the long development phase uh, done by a big industrial consortium, it's now in the consolidation phase done by a smaller consortium where Cozilab is a part of it. And we expect that the minimum viable product will be available in summer this year and will be used for the first pilot uh, project. Um, there is also a bunch of uh, potential applications uh, and satellites, um, spacecrafts uh, looking to uh, use it once the MVP is available. One of them is NeoSat from uh, Airbus Defense and Space. Uh, also, uh, different mission control systems for missions to be launched after 2025 are looking at it, like Copernicus. Uh, a set of ground stations, uh, control systems, also Columbus uh, here and Altius are considering using EGCC. Um, basically, since it's a long living project covering more than 20 years, uh, there will be permanent maintenance, improvement uh, uh, to take new technologies and new developments into account, to take uh, new user needs uh, into consideration and uh, to keep it running basically uh, over this time. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Thank you. I would I would conclude our discussion here because we have mo used most of our time. Um, I would thank you all for the insightful debate. Um, and let's see if there are there will be some questions still from the audience that that the panelists can uh, can answer. Um, and while we're waiting for the question, perhaps uh, I caught something that that Jean you said previously. You said that the current ESOC system is well known by industry and the users. And will the existing missions get migrated to the new system? Does ESA foresee some sort of migration tools? Yes, indeed. Um, we plan actually as a validation step of um, EcoCC, which will be um, the ESA customized uh, version of EGSCC for its own missions. Um, by adopting um, EGSSC for existing missions, um, because this gives a great opportunity uh, to compare the results and the behavior of the new MCS with respect to the old one. If we have a flying mission, it's also more relaxed because it's routine operation. The flight control team uh, is not in stress with uh, you know, critical maneuvers of the spacecraft. So um, it's a phase um, where we have both the time and the confidence in the old system. Uh, to adopt a new system side by side as a so-called shadow operation. Um, we plan to start this uh, beginning of next year uh, with one mission and then having other missions uh, to, to uh, follow on on this exercise. Um, 
And uh, yes, for migrating um, uh, the mission uh, model, uh, we have actually a tool, uh, we have developed a tool that migrates um, the uh, current uh, ESA industry standard uh, for ESA missions, the MIP, uh, into an ETSC model. Um, so that allows us to uh, convert at least the bulk uh, data uh, uh, automatically and uh, uh, then uh, do further adjustments um, to uh, customize it to the, to the new system. I see. I see. Thank you. Um, just before we close, one more thing. It was We were talking about the stakeholders and how the community could get involved. Is there a specific point of contact for interested parties to contribute for to the development? How do the interesting parties, uh, interested parties, join? Well, at the moment, it works via ESA framework. So there are tenders uh, dedicated to EGCC. Uh, also, if you have uh, national delegation support, uh, there are ways. But uh, in general, uh, if you have uh, any inquiries. Uh, you can contact the uh, technical officer of the EJCC, uh, which is Robert Blomenstein, and I will put his um, email into the chat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. So I think that if we I have just... to finish the webinar as we have consumed most of our time, I would like to thank you again, Jean, Jakob, Micha, Diego, and of course to all the participants to, for joining us. Please don't hesitate to contact us um, and have a nice rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you.